Okay, just want to uh, welcome everybody on Zoom uh, to USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel, and then also on YouTube Live. Uh, so make sure you're typing in any questions you have for the ADM managers on a Q&A box. And then if you're on YouTube, I'll be monitoring both. So um, make sure that you send those questions in and we're uh, very excited to have um, four of our ADM managers. And this is something that we're gonna do probably about monthly or so um, and having, we have 12 different ADM managers and we wanna kind of bring them in and they, they live life on the road and they're, they're servicing a lot of different areas and associations throughout our country. So I'll let everybody kind of introduce themselves. Richie, you can go first and then we'll go Kenny, Joe, and then Scott. Thanks, Dave. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Rich Hansen. I'm the ADM Regional Manager for the state of New York in the Atlantic District. Um, I grew up, played my youth hockey in Long Island, uh, played my college hockey at Mercyhurst University, bounced around a little bit after that, and uh, the pros just to kind of delay the inevitable of settling down and getting a job. And now I'm uh, blessed to be working in the player development side at USA Hockey. My turn, David. Uh, I'm Kenny Rausch. I'm actually the director of youth hockey for USA Hockey. I'm not an ADM manager per se, but I do oversee uh, the great state of Alaska for ADM purposes. I actually grew up all over our country. I was born in New Jersey, lived there till I was seven, in Michigan for two years, Minnesota for two years, then to Connecticut where uh, I played high school hockey and went to play my college hockey at Boston University. Uh, soon after that, I got into coaching. I coached college hockey for 14 years. And I am now in year 11 here with USA Hockey. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for checking in with us today. <clears throat> My name is Joe Bonnet. I'm the ADM Regional Manager for Rocky Mountain and parts of Pacific. Uh, I grew up outside Detroit, uh, played youth hockey in Detroit growing up, uh, played one year in the North American League for the old Redford Royals, uh, played my collegiate hockey at Western Michigan, and then I got into coaching using the Miami of Ohio um, graduate assistant program, coached at Miami, coached a long time at Colorado College, and I'm in my fifth year now with USA Hockey. So thanks for joining us, and I look forward to the, the discussion. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Pollock, uh, and I am the uh, regional manager for both the Mid-Am and Southeast districts. I grew up in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and played uh, my college hockey at uh, Bowling Green State University in the 80s and then uh, coach college hockey for 19 years uh, at Bowling Green and Boston College and I'm now back uh, with USA Hockey and have been here for 10 years. So just want to kind of start this off and you know we get a lot of questions I know you guys are on the road a lot and you know we're seeing different coaches and associations and players and you know, sometimes we have, what is the ADM? You know, I know we could say it's the American development model, but how did it start? I know some of you were here from the very start. Um, if one of you guys would kick this off and we can go from there. Pooch, you're one of the originals. Yeah, I didn't know, uh, yeah, that, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, I am one of the, uh, the senior members, uh, yeah, like I said, 10 years ago, basically, uh, uh, Dave, you know, the, uh, the process started long before uh, our evolution uh, getting started 10 years ago, the actual uh, official formation of the American development model uh, in what you currently see uh, in, in its present form. Uh, the, uh, the impetus started with USA Hockey uh, prior to that, being able to really do a, a deep look at the current state at that time of, uh, of youth sports, of youth hockey, uh, and it had an opportunity to uh, uh, attend some seminars and uh, really focusing on athlete development, human performance, uh, uh, child behavior, and, and ultimately looking at what was best for, uh, for young athletes and the development of young athletes. And then uh, both uh, Kenny Martell and uh, Kevin McLaughlin were able to put together a, a series of ideas uh, and presented those uh, uh, to, to, to USA Hockey. And, and basically, uh, the American development w w was created. And it was at the time, a, uh, uh, a, a, like I said, a looking inward at what was happening in our sport and ways we could do better and evolve a formation of principles based on uh, science and based on ultimately 
uh, how we can best serve our young athletes, how we can best develop young athletes. And it's been a, uh, it's been a process, been an ongoing process uh, for 10 years. And uh, it's really been uh, quite fast. I always tell people that I've learned more in terms of athlete performance in the last 10 years than I did uh, all the years of playing and in, in, in coaching collegiately, uh, just uh, primarily with the opportunity to just focus on human performance and athlete development. It yeah, Pooja, well, yeah, I'd echo that as, as well. I mean, like you said, we, we all coached, the uh, majority of us coached college hockey for a long period of time. The guys had started with the, the ADM, and it was amazing within – a year or two years of working with young kids, you learn so much more about development. Uh, I'd say, David, one of the big misnomers about the ADM and when it first started, right, our big cross, our push was cross ice hockey for the younger ages and 8U and stuff. So that, that kind of became synonymous with the ADM at first. But the reality is it's, it's a comprehensive plan and the ADM's age appropriate, high performance path of development for all ages. And it's, you know, best practices for training and competition. And it's not just one age group. It's what's right for that age at that time. That's, that's, that's a really good point, Kenny. And, and I would I'd add in, as I travel around to my associations and people I work with, the discussions we're having is, is the ADM's a lifestyle. It's, it's, do you walk into the rink with good energy? Are you prepared to do off ice? Are you prepared to have a good practice? Are you prepared to, have, um, to really develop an athlete? Um, and it's, it's a lifestyle from, from six years old to, to beer league. And, and it's really what you make of it. It's, it's, we have, there's a lot of recommendations out there, but the ADM is not a cookie cutter um, philosophy. Um, each, each association has different hurdles um, and it's how you use our recommendations to the best of your ability to really service the youth hockey player of our country so that they love the game, they're better athletes, uh, they pursue hockey for a long time and we're a better sport than soccer, football and baseball. Yeah, I mean, you guys, you guys nailed it. But again, I just I, I want to reiterate the age appropriateness because um, it, it's delivering fun, and what fun looks like for an eight-year-old is is not what it's going to look like for a sixteen-year-old. And it's our it's our job for our coaches to understand that. Um, I think ten, you know, you go back years ago and you'd see a lot of our practices. I think a lot of our coaches were were out watching what a what a high level maybe college practice looked like or an NHL practice, and oh, I'm going to deliver that to my younger players. So. It's really understanding what engagement looks like for younger players. Um, is it the same as it looks for 16-year-olds? Probably not. Um, and then really guiding these players to, to develop their own passion for the game as coaches is, I think, what our job is. So, so I know other associations or other national governing bodies have um, instituted the ADM afterwards. Do you guys know the numbers of how many are instituted? Well, the USOPC actually has – given all the NGBs, national governing bodies, a mandate to come up with their own version of the ADM. I don't want to use the word stole, but they kind of took our idea, say, hey, what you guys are doing, we are way ahead of the curve with making things age appropriate for kids and trying to keep more kids in the game and grow the game. And our numbers have actually uh, grown in the last seven to 10 years, whereas almost every other sport has declined. So the USOPC saw that and they're like, hey, hockey's ahead of this and doing some really good things and has mandated that all the NG other NGBs come up with their own plan. And a lot have already. Uh, lacrosse has, soccer has, football has, you know, the big ones. But uh, they're all following suit. That's cool. So here's the, here's the real question. What do you, as an ADM manager, what do you do on your every day? You know, like if you're starting your week, and I know we're, you know, in the pandemic right now, but, you know, come in in the fall, wh what are you doing? Like what's your typical week? What, what are you typically doing working with? people uh i mean for me you know we're kind of that conduit between usa hockey and, and and the associations you know we're out there we're in the field uh with our associations and whether it's parent education on ice demonstration body checking clinics um you know we really get to, to to know the people there and maybe cater a program to what their needs are um every association is different um i know in my territory uh, the issues that are up in the, the Adirondacks in Northern New York are a lot different than down in Long Island. So it's, it's really my job to, to build a relationship with the hockey directors and the coaches uh, and the volunteers and, and cater what, what their needs are. And, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer that, you know, for, you know, someone who was around in the, uh, you know, the early formation, you know, the, the, 
our responsibilities have, have evolved uh, so much over the last 10 years. I know uh, when we first, uh, uh, when we first started, we, a lot of us we were going around in our areas, really kind of uh, getting as much information out to as many people as possible. And that, that took the form in a lot of different ways, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, going in into rinks and being on ice with, with coaches and players, off ice with coaches and parents and, and players for that matter. Uh, but, but it just evolved in terms of getting as much information out uh, as possible. And over the years, it started to take more form with uh, a lot of associations uh, reaching out to expand on that. You know, how can we now take this information further? Uh, and so there's always been a little bit more added to it. And I think it's been uh, the recognition of hey, the, the, the high performance piece of this in terms of what, what high performance may look like at 16 and 18 is certainly different. Uh, than what it may look like at uh, uh, 8, 10, 12. And that's the responsibility, I think, that uh, Kenny was talking about earlier, the age-appropriate uh, part of what we, we do daily is very, is very important for uh, uh, associations to uh, continue to work with that and get to the point, like, like Richie said, hey, what's right for your current association? Yeah, what's, what's really enjoying with the job is, is not only – servicing a lot of the different clubs, you know, from, from the board to the coaches, to the players, to the parents, but really building relationships with the hockey directors and the coaches, walking into those ranks and being really the face of USA Hockey and hearing the good and hearing the bad and, and trying to support each one of the associations when they ask for it. it what's interesting is, is how many people are, are reaching out and asking for help from the ADM managers. And, you know, having that conversation on behalf of USA Hockey, this is, these are the recommendations. How does this fit your club and how do we get your club better? Uh, not only to keep more kids playing hockey, but ultimately to develop some pretty good players down the line. It's, it's, it's pretty rewarding. And, and part of two of what we do is, is best practices around the world. We have the uh, luxury and, and the ability to connect with other federations. We have great working uh, partnerships with, with Finland and Sweden and we get to go visit those guys. They come and so we say, okay, what are you guys doing well? What do you think we're doing well? So it's an really interesting thing that way where we see what's really working well around the world and we can try to deliver that back to you know, the people in the United States. And, you know, I'm the, the quote unquote, I'm not a, a, a manager, but like I have other parts of my job as well. Like I help oversee our national championships and uh, help with our, our player development camp. So I got my hands in a lot of different cookie jars. So every day is a little bit different for each and every one of us in a different way. But again, like I said, the best part about it is we get to see uh, and do, we live research and development all the time, which is what's awesome. So, so Kenny, you bring up a great point that the side jobs keep the job awesome too. You're working the national camps, uh, Scotty Pollock did the, the youth Olympic games. Uh, Roger's done the, um, uh, the, co the collegiate games. Uh, being over, being able to do the Halinka, the Five Nations, going to Finland, going to Sweden, uh, researching and, and, and really reinventing ourselves on a six-month basis has been a, a real nice part of the job that I wasn't expecting, but it's been, it's been rather enjoyable. So um, there's a lot of talk about where hockey was, where hockey is right now, and what the future will hold with hockey um, or the game of hockey. Um, some of you have played, you know, in the 80s, some in the 90s, some in the 2000s. Uh, where, where did you, where have, talk about like the past and present state of hockey, and we'll talk about the future in a minute. I, I think one, let the old guy go first. <laughs> you want to go, Kenny? No, I was going to say let the old guy go first. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the guy who's seen a little bit, but I think what's great is, you know, for people who, um, on this call that have been able to uh, listen into the webinars, the previous webinars, the last three weeks, I think everyone has really touched on, on the state of the game. And it's pretty, uh, when, you, when you really try to focus on, and, and it, you know, a lot of ways it's our responsibility to make sure we have developmental principles and play for today's game. And we spent a lot of time asking, asking the coaches, uh, and even with players and parents, hey, what is, what does today's game look like? And I think, We've been fortunate the last three weeks to hear it from a lot of different people talk about today's game. And the, the common themes are there and heard it again today. The game's not getting any slower, it's getting faster and faster. The, the thinking of the game uh, now is at an all-time high. You, you have to be able to play the game 
uh, with pace and think uh, and think the game the right way. I think the uh, uh, it's now the it, it is final level in terms of how, how fast the game uh, has gotten. And you see the players who are excelling in our game today are able to play the game uh, with that pace. They match that with the skill, but ultimately uh, their hockey sense, their ability to problem solve on the ice is, uh, is, is tremendous. And those are the type of players that we'll see excel in our game. And I think it's been fun to watch. And we've had, in the, there was, was outstanding hockey players 75 years ago, 50 years ago, and all the way through the last 20 years to, to what we have right now. And everybody's been able to adapt to the way that game, the game was at that time. And I think what we see now, uh, certainly in terms of, of pace, uh, stick positioning, uh, both offensively and, de and defensively, and then the ability to think uh, your way around the ice is so important. I think to piggyback off of that, Pooch, you said it's not getting any slower, or you know, it's continually getting faster. It's all not getting smaller. Well, yes, there are some smaller players in the National Hockey League nowadays, but on average, the players are getting bigger and bigger, which means the space is shrinking, right? So what we're seeing is the game is played in small areas all over the ice. Like the way the game's taught right now, it's, you know, we don't want to use the term positionless. I actually got a great term from uh, Brant Burgley, the reactionary positions where people are in different spots all over the ice. I know like when you played as youth, even when I played youth hockey, you know, the right defenseman could only go to the blue line and he couldn't pass the left post. You know, those were the rules that we played by. Now you see defensemen leading rushes. You see defensemen making passes to each other in the offensive zone below the hash marks. So it's, it is a different game and, Players play in all different positions and, and situations. And the fact that it's all small area stuff, like hit pause in a game and you'll see 10 to 11 grown men in a six of the ice all the time. So if we're not putting our youngest kids to be in a position to make plays in small areas, they're not going to have success at the older ages, whether it's house hockey or, or elite level hockey, doesn't matter. Like we're, we're not about just making elite players. We're about making players for life. But if you can't play and have fun and have success, you're not, not going to want to keep playing. Right. I was just thinking, I think it was you, Rouch, uh, before, one of our level fours, you put the uh, 96 World Cup game yeah. on before, the, uh, before your presentation. And those are two arguably the best teams at that time in the world. And, and when you watch that game, and I'm sure people now with no hockey on, there's a lot of games they're putting on from the early 2000s and, and playoff games. And the game has changed so much. And, and the rules are changing. Um, you know, you see some of the, the, the non-calls that were happening. So they're trying to, they were trying to speed up the game. Uh, try to add more scoring. So, yeah, like the, the guy said before, I mean, that guys are bigger, stronger, they're faster, and then, um, and, and they're not slowing down. Yeah, it's uh, through the eyes of the kids. It's amazing. I mean, seeing what the kids are doing skill wise on the ice, on on you know online and all their skill drills in the in the uh, driveway is pretty. It's pretty fun. I was actually on a Zoom call with some youth coaches last week, and uh, because of the COVID and the downtime, they're watching old hockey games, as Richie was talking about. And his daughter, who plays defense, who's 14 years old, said, why do the defensemen in the old-time game, why do they skate backwards so much, Dad? And, you know, the, the game's evolving, and it's, it's the, kids, the kids aren't sitting around waiting. And I like what Pooch said. It's, it's not getting uh, slower. It's not getting dumber. And it's not getting uh, uh, less skilled. Uh, speak Speaking of the game changing, I had someone uh, shoot me a note about uh, changing the game and really about changing rules. Someone asked, uh, you know, we changed checking from out of peewees now and it starts at how do we think it's working out and don't we think that kids should be learning to hit in an earlier age, which uh, it's actually true. We actually want body contact to start at eight years old. They're actually eight U, six U, where body contact, kids playing in small areas and not running into each other. Then it 10 and 12, they should actually be doing it every day in practice. Every day there should be body contact games, drills, stations, whatever you want to call it. So by the time they do become 13 and full body checking is legal, right? They've been doing it for potentially five to six, seven, eight years, and it should be a seamless transition. And, you know, quite frankly, I think it's working out pretty well because we're starting to see a a wave of super skilled kids, which was really the reason why we started it. People thought, you know, we got lucky with the safety part, but it really started as a skill development part because going around doing clinics with young kids, you'd find kids ask one of two questions. Actually, they'd ask one question and is there hitting here? And it was one of two reasons why, right? The little guy wanted to know if he was going to get smushed and the big guy wanted to know if he could smush the little guy. So if we took the focus out of the physical play or the violent play 
put the focus back on the puck and making plays because we want the game to be physical. We just don't want it to be violent and stupid. And, you know, you look at some of the best players in the world right now, a guy like Austin Matthews, no one's going to argue that he doesn't play physically. I think last year he threw a total of less than 40 hits over the course of the year. And you can argue that that's a six foot three, 220 pound guy who's really, really physical, really skilled, plays the game the right way. That's what we're looking for. Hey, Kenny, on that too, and I, I also think the, uh, the, the, the biggest piece for me has been the, the, the body contact at the younger ages. I think so much of the, uh, tr the translation with the, with the rule change uh, a few years back had so much to do with, you know, going from Pee Wee to, uh, or excuse me, from uh, 12 U to 14 U with the full body contact. But the reality is the body contact, the world we lived in before that was pretty much cold turkey, no contact to full body checking. And now we added a whole layer, whether it be anywhere from, uh, you know, six to eight years, sometimes of body contact leading into your full opportunity to check. And I think what's created because just by, by rule and by context, you're, the, the, the puck play, the contact play is your, your stick, as long as it's making a play on the puck, the contact that ensues is legal. So now the, puck, the stick is in the right area, and the stick on puck and stick on stick play, in my mind, has, has increased dramatically. And you see now the smartest players in the game have their sticks in the right areas, and they're, they're, they're down. They're taking away the time and space on the puck. They have their stick in the passing lanes to, to break up plays. It's just been, to me, uh, tremendous. And I think that the confidence that's been gained with players, uh, there's the, the, when you watch a game now in that transition time, 12, 13, 14, the confidence with the puck is at an all time high. And I think it's been fabulous. So, so recently coaching 12, you, uh, 14, you, you're exactly right, Pooch. And it goes back to the original premise with Dave asked us is that the game has changed. It's changed from maybe a blow up a guy to a puck possession game. And I think successful teams and high-level coaches now expect puck possession. So what you just described, Pooch, is how do you get the puck back with that stick technique, the angling, pursuing the puck? Yes, yes, you're going to play the body, but the, the main objective is to get the puck back because those are the teams that are winning, those are the teams that are scoring, and those are really the style of play that these young kids want to are, are starting to play and we're starting to see. One of the tools that I've used coaching the the 14 and 12 you recently youth hockey is the off ice body checking series. And, and to be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't do it a lot early, but watching coaches do it, watching other programs doing it and doing it myself, to me, it had the biggest translation from off ice, full body contact drills in your equipment with helmet and stick with tennis shoes um, and really creating a safe environment for the kids to, to build up that contact confidence, knowing that they're not going to get hurt, letting them experience how to absorb a check and then watching them at the 12 U age, even at the 10 U age, and of course at the 14 U age, go out there with a little bit of that under their belt, that experience to start their body checking um, careers. So um, kind of going into the development side of it. And, you know, we, we talk about development is not linear, it's nonlinear. Can you guys talk about, you know, that in your experiences with coaching college hockey, and working with some of our the top top athletes and what you see with the top athletes, but also with some of our youth athletes. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is kids develop differently and at different rates. You know, the the new analogy is popcorn. You put the popcorn in the bowl, right? Put the kernels in the bowl. It's the same temperature, the same. Some pop earlier than others. Some pop way later than others. Right? Every kid is an experiment of one. You know, we know that cognitively, physically, emotionally, kids can be plus or minus three years and what their actual age is. So to compare ourselves and our kids and other kids to each other is really doing a disservice to them all. And, you know, we throw out the term late bloomer all the time. In reality, it's a normal bloomer, right? There are very few kids mature early. And those are the kids that usually have success at younger ages. And some of them continue to have that success. But not many do because of the normal bloomers. And, you know, you look around college hockey and you'll see all these kids who are coming out of college hockey as free agents at 22, 23 years old. It's because at 17 years old, they might not have been hit their genetic peak yet. So, you know, we, we need to be patient. And the biggest, that's probably the biggest and hardest thing to do is to remain patient with every kid. So I have a couple of development myths that I, I want you, you all to kind of just chat on. So, 
have about four right here. So my first one is that, you know, I've seen and I heard as I was growing up, you have to be on the best team to develop. What, what do you guys say about that? Well, I'll, I'll certainly answer that. I, I, I don't agree with it one bit. I think the, uh, I think the play development occurs when, when players are given the opportunity to do many things in a game. And I think the, uh, the opportunity for players, especially in those younger years and through the, you start getting into whether it be 14U, 15 only, 16U, players who have the opportunity to do a lot of different things in a game, number one, to, to participate a lot and to be involved in a lot of battles, be involved in many different situations. What we see sometimes is the same players doing a lot of the same things. I don't think the opportunity to develop and mature uh, is always the same on, on, on the same teams. I think players need to be in a lot of different type of developmental opportunities. Uh, so I would always, when talking to uh, parents and coaches and players, to find an opportunity where you're going to be given the opportunity, number one, to train properly, to be in a training opportunity to really develop as many a a aspects of your game as possible and not to be limited, whether by participation in a certain role or by lack of knowledge as to uh, what players should be focusing on at a, that the development around so much, it varies so much. It should be so many different developmental opportunities available to the young players. Yeah, go ahead, Richie, you want to say something real quick? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, we, I mean, we, we tend to do that a lot and, and you see these super teams built early and, you, and you're really just aggregating talent. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, you get these coaches and they'll say, well, we have no one to play. And if you aggregate the best talent and, and you're winning games 14, 15, nothing, um, it's not good for the, the team on the losing side. It's not, it's not good on the team that's winning. So, um, and you're not really allowing the cream to rise to the top where, you know, it's, it's better to stay home, stay local and, and be the best player as long as you can be. Uh, in my mind, it just, it, it goes to that development thing. You just talked to earlier that everybody's popping at a different time. So to put yourself in an, in an area or an environment where you're not getting that opportunity, um, you'll just never know, I think for those players. Uh, I, I'm actually living proof of the, the myth of that because in college hockey, I did play on the best team. I won a national championship my senior year, but the reality was, is I got to watch a lot of good college hockey. I wasn't the best player on those teams. So it, it was a great experience for me and I enjoyed it. And I, yes, I did develop, but would I have developed more playing somewhere where I was playing all the time? You know, who knows, you know, we have a long list of guys who played on relatively obscure teams, hockey, basketball, football, whatever it may be that go on and become mega stars like Steph Curry went to Davidson, right? Because he was too small in high school, couldn't even walk on to Virginia Tech where he wanted to go, right? So you don't need to play on the best team to become a good player. So, so I want to bring up a, a picture real quick that I just want to share. And I want you to let me know who you think this is. Um, I know you guys do, you know? So you got this, this athlete here, you know, he's younger right? Um, glasses and all of that. Looks like he's playing multiple sports. Do you have to excel early on this? Uh, this is one of my favorite ones ever. You got to love the Twitter, Twitter world. Like, I, I actually got into an argument with my dad over at Christmas time because he was my coach growing up. And, you know, he's a typical old school coach. I love him to death, but it's what we knew back then. And if this kid showed up at our baseball team tryouts and is as a 10 year old, there's no doubt he's playing right field. Right, because he looks like he's a little chubby. He doesn't look that athletic. He's got the glasses and the goggles on. Right, he doesn't doesn't look very athletic, and probably wasn't at ten years old. But as we know genetics, we know what he turns out to be: six foot four Thor. Right, and if we if we had judged that kid as a ten year old and pigeonholed him as a non athlete and didn't play him as much as the other kids, he probably would have quit the sport. Yeah. Hey, David, the other thing on excelling early in, in terms of hockey, which is interesting, is a lot of kids that do excel early um, are lauded. Um, you know, the, the, the prepubescent 12U, 10U kid that can take the puck coast to coast, shoot high, shoot hard, uh, score the three to six goals a game to win games, that those, those kids are 
those kids are good to have on your team in a sense that because you're going to win a lot of games. But what's interesting is often those kids are not the best kids, 14, 16, 18 new, um, because we know that kids catch up with kids. And I think what the ADM provides is, you know, with a lot of the stuff that we're recommending, specifically the small area games and the thinking is if you put the, those early excellers, the big, strong kids in an environment that they get a lot of resistance, that they have to make a lot of decisions, that their skating has to be really good in tight spaces, um, their fall off won't be as hard as kids that are just allowed to go red line to goal line with no thinking just because they're the biggest and strongest. So I think as a coach, if you do have an early acceler, it's your job. How do I put this kid in an environment that he's not going to get passed up in two or three years and all these other kids are fighting for their life with the puck. They have to think um, they're weak and they're going to get stronger than this kid. How do you keep those kids ahead and still in the game when a lot of those early accelerators in hockey, by the time 14 rolls around and the body checking is, is, is uh, implemented, and a lot of kids catch up size-wise, those kids now are vanilla and they mix right in and they fall behind. And, and I think the ADM gives you a lot of tools and resources to keep those kids involved and really to keep those kids ahead if, if it's implemented properly. So you brought up skating and I know we were saying how much faster the game is getting. And, you know, you see players like Connor McDavid and these um, superstars, Kendall Coyne flying around being super fast skaters. How do you teach the skating and how do you develop the skating and make it transferable? Well, I, I'll start it off, and I'm sure you guys have thoughts too. I, I think the thing with skating is um, it's such an important component of our sport. And in order to skate, have a good foundation in skating, it's going to allow you to experience the sport in a very creative and positive way. So there's no question you need to get, uh, you need to build a good skating foundation for your 8, 10, 12, 14 new level athletes. So, but what does that look like? And, and what we're finding out is how do you engage, how do you engage players now? to explore their, their, their surfaces of the ice the surf, and their inside and their outside edges. And, you know, is it, skating is a technical uh, skill and, and some technicality and breakdowns are good, but all kids are not gonna look like a perfect skater because as we know, they have different body types. They're, they're different, they're along different uh, areas of their development, of their pu pubescent development. So how do, we, how do we engage the kid to skate? And I think what we're starting to see now, a lot of associations of coaches are, are hiding their, their skating skills. Uh, they're, they're, they're implementing them through games. They're getting kids to jump uh, hurdles, jump pads, uh, fall on their outside edges, uh, change paths, change directions as quick as they can, as slow as they can, uh, while doing other activities. Um, one, to keep them engaged, but two, to make sure that they're getting the proper reps so that their skating does evolve over time. And it, I walk in and I see an association at the AU level and they have kids changing directions, uh, falling, getting up and down, starting positions from their back and their knees, uh, chasing around dividers, playing tag, jumping in, jumping out. To me, that's a really good foundation for a 10 year old kid now to start building his skating stride as muscles and puberty starts to take over. What do you guys think on that? Hey, Joe, I think in, on that, and Dave, you mentioned Kendall, she's not a great player because she's, she, she skated extremely fast in, in, the, in the skill. She's a great player because of that speed, utilizes it in the game the, the, the right way. And she's able to, as Joe said, uh, change speed so well. And to be able to uh, uh, deceptively uh, find the open ice and then use the speed to go around, around players. And I think that's so important. I, you know, as we, someone had mentioned earlier, uh, some of the open ice at young ages when, when we – uh, when we don't put players in, in, in a proper uh, environment uh, in terms of uh, shrinking the rink down, uh, there is a lot of false ice out there. And you can, you can just skate around, and you, the player who physically at that time may be the fastest skater is going to have an advantage. But over time, the game evolves where players are now forced to think of where the open ice is. How can I uh, use something other than pure speed to, uh, to be effective? You, you need that because uh, – uh, as you continue to uh, move up the, the chain, all the players can can move extremely well. So how do I use that speed? And I think uh, you mentioned uh, with Kendall, she, she's a great player because she's able to uh, use the speed properly in the context of a, of a, of a high-level hockey game. Yeah. Richie, you have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I was thinking because – 
obviously teaching skating at the younger ages, it can get kind of monotonous and boring. And how do you do that? And I, I thought Joe nailed it with, you know, hiding it within games and, and hiding skill development, um, especially at the younger ages. Um, but I was thinking about my trip over in, in, in Finland and, and having players take uh, ownership in their own development. And I remember watching a practice and I saw one player, you know, just working on his stride. And, and I asked the coach, you know, why was he the only one doing that? And he said, you know, we talked about his skating. He felt that he needed to get better. And he went out on his own and, and found the coach and said, hey, I, I want to work on this. And um, to be able to do that at the older ages, I think, is, is really important and have players recognize what their strengths, what their weaknesses are and, and, and want to work on that because strict, you know, you see a lot of, you know, we're going to do Russian circles and we're going to work on skating and, and some kids are just not into it. And, and it's really tough to, um, tough I, to teach, I feel. So into and Joe's point about everybody's a different skater. If you look at other sports, you know, you look at baseball, how many different swings are out there? You look at a swing like Kevin Euclid, uh, one of the ugliest batting stances out there and, and, and the guy can just get it done. So, there's players out there that are just hockey fast. They just, you know, they might not be fast skating from goal line to goal line, but when they're in a game and there's a loose puck, it might not be pretty, but they're going to get there. So. Richie, Richie, that's a great point because, you know, the technique and the prettiness of skating, you look at the all time greatest scorers in the national hockey league history. A lot of them were labeled as poor skaters. You know, you, you know, Gretzky, uh, Yager, how Ron Francis maybe said one of the worst skaters ever, and he's number five in points of all time. And the list goes on and on when you when you Mike look. Mike Bossy, uh, Mike Bossy, Adam Oates, Dale Howard, Chuck, right? You know, um, Luke Robitaille couldn't skate. Yari Curry couldn't skate, but him and Gretzky had magic. And it's that ability to get to places and get to pucks quickly, not necessarily fast or be a blazer. Or you know, we see it in our country where we there are kids who can skate a hundred miles an hour but they can't play because when you put the puck on the ice and put it on their stick, their legs are still going hundred miles an hour, but their brains and their hands can't keep up. So kind of going on building that hockey sense and what you're doing and, you know, just chatting with you, you know, in the past couple of years, how has your practices changed from when you were coaching college or wherever, you know, you know, you, I know you probably had a different way of how you practice and how have you evolved and how, you, how have you gotten made it different, you know, because it wasn't a bad way of you doing it the way you were doing it before, but I know you're trying to find a, a better way. Yeah. I look at the old practices we used to run coaching college hockey and, and there, there's days I want to throw up in my mouth or right? have so much standing around and pre predisposed notions of where you had to go in a certain drill and flow drills to warm up the goalies and, we just didn't put enough kids in positions to be successful, right? With the way we run practices now or design practices now is, is we're looking to engage kids, challenge them, make it look like the game so that they're always in those positions where there's constant decision-making that they're going to see in a game situation. So if you're still running practices where you aren't engaging kids and making them think and putting them in game-like situations, we're doing our kids a disservice. And knowing what more, go ahead, Joe. Uh, real, real short, knowing what I know now, David, two, two specific things. Now I add a lot more conflict to my practices, whereas before I didn't. And the second thing is – What's I would, conflict? Uh, what resist, resistance. It, it, nothing is done uh, without resistance, without a, without a real thought having to be made or a decision. So I would, add, I would add a lot more conflict now, and I would also look at my practice times. And 50 to, 50 to 60 minutes – Knowing what we know now, uh, you can accomplish a lot of things in 60 minutes with a single team or uh, two teams on the ice. And, you know, we used to go two and a half hours in practice and pat ourselves on the back. You can get things done in 60 minutes, and I would add more conflict. Yeah, yeah. adding on that, Joe, I agree. The, you know, and we're hearing more even uh, in the last three weeks with, with the webinars, uh, some of the uh, coaches of older players talking more and more about uh, running uh, what running drills now with uh, with all uh, game like uh, create creativity and I think the the days of uh, I give you a puck and tell you where to pass it tell you where to go uh, I think everybody's now realizing the, the downfall of that when we when we look at the game and the amount of puck battles there are and we, we all want players who can who can win puck battles those are I mean, we we talk about all the time one 
I want a competitive book kid who could come out of, out, of, out, of the, out of the scrum with a puck. Well, how often are we practicing that? Is that part of our, is that a priority in practice? Battling for pucks, moving to a puck, finding yourself in, in a, getting your body in a position to uh, win pucks and be confident with it. And I think that's a, it's a huge skill. And then when you start extending that further and getting them to the point where I was, you know, hearing from some of the, uh, the coaches of older players now, Hey, what happens when you, when you're in the, you're in a scrum and you win the puck? Now does a decision be made? Is there a time to find the open space? Is there, is there a player coming for support? Uh, and then if I don't win the puck, where am I going? Where's my first step? Where's my stick? Uh, I think so important that, uh, the game, as you mentioned, Joe, looks like a game, uh, and we're playing that way. And we're in a position to think uh, whether, you know, what role am I in at the current time? The other part that we think we change a lot of is what we do off the ice as well. I, I actually want to ask Richie to touch on his last trip to Finland and what he saw as far as what they do pre and post practice as well. Um, yeah, it, before that, I just want to, I mean, obviously, I, I agree on what everybody says, and it, it pretty much says, you know, we, we want to train in reality and, and what the game looks like. And uh, for me, um, obviously, a, a lot less experience than the other three guys on here. But uh, and, and I've changed, I mean, I've changed a ton. It's more, and it, for me, it's more how I was coaching. I was, I was really big into, I see a mistake, and I would run over or skate over to a player and, and tell him what he did wrong. And, and that was it, right? And and now I'm kind of changing where I'm, I'm more asking questions and I'm, I'm trying to have that player come up with the answer where, where I'd ask them, Hey, what'd you see here? And, and they would tell me, or what, what could you have done differently? And, and really try to have them come up with the answers on their own. I think that's so important because, you know, a lot of players now are, are timid, not a lot are, are timid, but sometimes players can be timid or you, you come at them pretty hard and you're yelling at them where to be and you understand and, they say yeah, and, and they probably don't. But I think it's just so much more powerful uh, changing that method of coaching. Um, and as far as what Kenny was saying for the off ice, I mean, that, that's I mean that's just the lifestyle over there. You know, Finland, Sweden. I mean, it's so big. You get to the rink. You know, practice starts at seven o'clock. That's that's off ice. You know, they're they're doing some kind of training where they're um, some off ice where they're jumping, hopping on one foot. A lot of core strength. Um, and it doesn't matter. There's no, uh, it's too cold out. It's raining. I mean, we were, we were up in the northern part of Finland when, and I, I, I mean, I was taking video and I, I took a screenshot of the, the temperature. It was minus 15 degrees in the dark. And these kids are out in the parking lot. Um, it wasn't anything big weight room or, or weights. They were just out there, you know, getting better, getting stronger. And that's, um, you know, we were laughing, uh, Dan Jablonik and myself were saying, wow, how many, how many lawsuits do we have right now being out in this in weather? <laughs> in here. So it's just, a, it's just a different culture, different mentality. Um, and that's just something I think we're trying to help change and, um, you know, help our coaches out. So they implement some kind of program like that, because if, if that's what you want to be, if you want to be a hockey player and, and at 13 years old, moving forward, that's the stuff that I, I believe or we believe you have to do. So, so Joe, uh, or really everybody, but I just want to bring up, you know, we know that the strength training is important. We're going to have Brian Gallivan from the NTDP on Tuesday next week about kind of some at-home strategies that you can do for with your athletes. But you have the younger kids, you know, the pre-pubescent kids. What can you do with them uh, off the ice? And, and like, there's not a train, there's not a gym at the rink or you might so only have a little area. So, so the clubs that, that I've seen that are successful in this, the, the first thing that's really important is, and it's an old quote that comes to mind, is if the club thinks that off-ice, off ice, not I want to say conditioning, but off-ice activity is important, you'll find a way to do it. The clubs that don't really believe in it and just kind of say it, it, they'll make an excuse why they can't. My rink doesn't allow it. Like Richie was talking about, it's too cold outside. We don't have a, enough money to pay somebody. And what I found is the clubs that say, you know what, we know, we know that the sport of ice hockey is an, ex is an extremely difficult sport to learn. We know it's a late specializing sport. We know that you have to be a very good athlete to be a very good hockey player to have success playing hockey. So we want to build athletes first. Now, there's a lot of clubs that I talked about. They just say, you know what, we don't have the room, time or space or professionals to run it. But I work with the, the clubs that I've seen around the country, around my region, they make it a priority. And what, what a lot of clubs do, and, and, these, and I can give you real examples, is that they go out and they, 
uh, they recruit parents that might not be able to skate, parents that really want to be involved, parents that have no hockey background, but they have maybe an athletic background, a phys ed teacher, an ambulance driver, um, a nurse, um, a dad that might, might have been an ex-Marine, okay, that wants to give back but has no confidence of skating. Well, those parents are going to add a lot of value to your club. And what we've encouraged clubs uh, to do is you don't have to do off-ice training and off-ice activity every single time you come to the rink. I'm a firm believer that off-ice activity cannot ruin your night. It cannot be a three-hour night for your club because parents don't have three hours, and that's unrealistic. I also think it's unrealistic asking the coach to come up with a practice plan, come up with the, um, the, the drills, organize the coaches, organize the, um, the, the, the tires and the dividers and the nets, and then still deliver off-ice. So you recruit a team of coaches. Who's going to run the off-ice? Who's going to be there 99.9% .9 of the time, on time, with energy to match the kids to deliver 20 minutes? It's all you need, prepubescent, 20 minutes of activities, games, balance agility coordination. You can use our cards. You can come up with better games, strength, core strength, all that type of stuff in a corner, in a parking lot, in some grass, on a hill of snow, somewhere in your rink to do that. And, and what we found with the clubs that do do that and deliver it consistently is not only do they have stronger kids, a lot of kids actually enjoy that more than the on ice practice sometimes, especially at the AU level, but you're, you're also developing, like our lacrosse coaches will come up and say, why are those kids so ready for lacrosse? Well, it's because they're athletes for six months playing hockey and they're strong second half of the season. And I always tell a story that um, one of the clubs that I work with down in Texas, they, would, they had a fat kid and he could touch his toes for the first time at Christmas and his parents are in tears. You're developing that confidence. You're developing that engagement of the kid to come to the rink, be sporty, right? Live a healthy lifestyle. And then, oh, by the way, I'm really going to enjoy hockey this year. And we see it with those types of parents can really give back and you can utilize those parents to really strengthen your club at, at, at good value for your club. That, that's just gold there, Joe. I mean, there's so much to do with those young kids, right? Simple as playing tag or whatever it is. And so many good things on and resources on social media, whether it be Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is, guys like Jeremy Frisch, you know, for young coach that don't know what to do with those young kids, you can find that stuff all over the place and it's out there and it's, you don't need a lot of resources. It's a great, great, great point. Especially in the time when they're uh, deleting a lot of the PE classes and all that. So we got to build that into our, you know, building the athletes. So now, so, um, so I got, I got a question. We're going to do a little Q and a right now, if that's good with you guys. Um, so one of the questions we have is what are your thoughts on staying with the same coach from 10 U to high school? <laughs> Uh, Joe, you lit up there, but I, <laughs> the, does the coach understand every age group along the way? And is the, is the coach, you know, a, a positive coach for, for, for young players? I think the most important thing is in, uh, in most environments, in, you know, I don't want to uh, skirt the question, uh, Dave, but I, it, it, every player deserves, every one of our young hockey players deserves a coach that cares and a coach that, that, that understands what that age group is yeah. developmentally. I think that's the most important thing. And if it happens to be one person who is outstanding with those kids and understands 8U, 10U, 12U, 14, all the way, then I'm for it. If it's somebody in within your association, if you have somebody who is unbelievable with understanding 8U or 10U and somebody who's great at 12, 14, uh, or 16, and that's, and they, they relate to the age group, they understand that age group, then that's the best for those kids. But regardless of where we're at, in the, uh, where you're at regionally across our country, every one of our young athletes, he or she deserve a, a coach that cares and a coach that understands what that age group means developmentally. Yeah, it, bang on, uh, Scotty. And, and to me, that's a hockey director question. Does, does your hockey director understand exactly what Scotty just said? Because, again, if, if you're pigeonholed with uh, a dad who doesn't understand the ages, uh, you know, the, the progression of the ages, it could be a tough situation. But, again, if you have somebody who – not now you're asking a coach, can he change his philosophy from one year to the other based on the growth of the kids? And if the answer is yes, that might not be a bad situation. But – 
you know, that's where a hockey director's got to get involved and make the judgments. You know, I have a great 8U coordinator here. Guy, you know what? I'm not sure if he could be a 12U coach, but he's great with the 8Us. Well, that's two different, that's two different skill sets. So as Scotty said, you just, you got to get the skill set and freshness is a good thing. Um, but um, you just really have to understand the age and how you deliver it. And part of it is I've actually done it. I've actually taken a group of 10, but it, this wasn't elite players. I was coaching uh, house level players that became B level players at Bantam and then high school hockey players. But the biggest difference was it wasn't just me. You have to have different voices as well. Right. So you can't just be one person all the time. You have to have other voices. So the kids don't get sick of hearing the same voice. It may be like having the same teacher from first grade through you know, senior year in high school. Yeah, they might be knowledgeable. And like Pooch said, they better know what each grade entails, but you have to have other people chime in as well. I was, I was kind of going down that path, Rashi. I mean, it's, it, it's not just hearing the same voice. It's also adaptability for the kids. I mean, that's just, that's just life. You're going to have different teachers. And when you get older, you're going to have different bosses. Some you like, some you don't like. And it's being able to adapt and, um, and handle those challenges uh, uh, as a player. Um, I think that's extremely important. Um, not to say if you have a coach going all the way up, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I, I wanted to ask the question to Joe, cause you, I remember asking you this question when, when it's your own son on the team and you were, I was like, you're going to coach and you were, you were saying, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's time for him to experience somebody else. So it kind of plays into that. So you clearly thought it was important for him to have a, a different look, a different voice and experience that. I did, Richie, and, and more specifically because of his age. And, um, you know, I coached him, I think, Pee Wee Bantam. And um, to me, as he entered the, the 18, 16 year level, it was time for him to make the game for himself. And I coached him for four years. He's heard my voice for four years. But to me, he had to have the initiative. He had to have the, his own drive to go and explore the game, I think, by himself. And, and um, I also have other kids I want to drop down to and spend time with. But for me, as they as as Noah entered 16, the, the the game was on his shoulders, and he had to go take it from there, and and um, that was the thought behind that. So we got a question from Doug. What common elements do you see in the clubs with the best development culture, and how do you promote that? Could you reread that again? What common elements do you see in the clubs with the best development culture? For me, I think every single it's the, the club is not if you have 12 teams, it's not 12 teams on a different page, you know, coaches doing their own thing. It's it's they're all they're all working from the same blueprint. Um, it's not to say that, that we have 12 coaches that are exactly the same, but they they have the same beliefs. Um, they have the same goals. They understand the age that they're coaching. Um, but again, you have a strong hockey director or a strong leader, whether it's a president, and um, they're kind of saying, hey, what's, this is how we're going to run this program, and you guys kind of go off and do your thing. We're not really pigeonholing them to coach in a certain way, but um, yeah. it's really um, everybody's kind of on the same page. The, 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 and you talk about that cohesiveness, sorry, Joe, that, that yep. cohesiveness. I think, uh, you know, the club culture, and, and, and Joe, I want you to talk on that as far as club culture, because I think you've you've nailed this presentation a number of times, but I, I want to just add that the cl top clubs that I that, you, that have seen around the country, on top of the club culture, they have a total commitment to the development of the individual uh, athlete, person, uh, every player, as I mentioned before, that they deserve that. And when the, the coaches care about the individual more than the results of a team, when they care about making players better, uh, on and off the ice. Uh, that's generally when you see the best results and, and ultimately leads to the most successful teams. Yeah, it, absolutely, Scott. And, and to me, real simple, it's, it's, it's a real strong board, a real strong leadership with a real clear vision. And what we're starting to see around the country now is, is what we've noticed in Finland and Sweden is that and it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a new profession. There's not a lot of professionals out there, but as a strong hockey director, that can then deliver the vision of the board. Can he communicate with the parents? Can he communicate with the coaches? Can he coach the coaches? You know, does he, does he have a real strong feel on what player development is? And I'm not saying competition and winning and losing is not important because it's very important. I understand that. But the clubs that really do a good job at development put player development ahead of winning. And then like Scotty said, winning will follow. 
But the ones that are kind of just trying to piecemeal a team so they can win here and there for, the, for whatever reason, those are the teams, the programs that kind of stutter. But the programs that have a strong vision, have a strong delivery method, and, have, and surround themselves with like-minded coaches. You know, that's the other thing. Sometimes you got to get rid of people that aren't on board. Sometimes you have to attract people that are thinking like you. And if you do that and have a strong vision with people that are like-minded, those are the clubs that, that are really taking some great steps in our country. So uh, just I have a question from Andrew on YouTube. And he was wondering, you know, and you, you all travel around to different associations. And it's not just model clubs you're traveling to. How do you get in touch with you or our other ADM managers for their associate come to for you to come to their association? ADMkids.com. We have all of our uh, map of the country of who covers what and our contact info is on there. So, so that's a good start, Andrew. I know you're listening, but then just want to. My last question for every single one of you, and I asked this with uh, Coach Verity yesterday. Looking back from when you started coaching what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> I wish it said when you played. Go ahead, Richie. Yes, I was just like, when I read that, I go, I wish it, I wish Start it said. Start with getting a haircut? Um, I, I think just understanding the, understanding the age and, and, and really having patience and, and you can't treat everybody the same. Um, it's really building relationships with these players and, and understanding what each player needs. Uh, you know, some players can, you can be a little harder on because that's what they need. And other players, if you act that way, they, they'll, they'll, you know, you know, curl up in a ball and, and not want to be a part of it anymore. So it's, it's really understanding, having patience for the game. And then this whole, this whole idea of training in reality for me is, is, is been, because I would, you know, my practices were very, you know, I wanted my practices to look good. I mean, you know, a bad pass. I was the coach jumping out there, blocking the pass, giving it back to him. But, you know, I'm not going to be there in the real game. So really training in reality, making my practices ugly um, and teaching in those games and, and those uh, and that kind of style. I, 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 Richie, I'm ahead, following up. I, I would, you know, my, my younger self is uh, a long time ago compared to uh, – to, to Richie there, but uh, well, my my biggest thing is you're if you're follow the passion if and if coaching is what you want to do, make sure you're getting into this profession for the right reason, and that you're that you really understand what is right for young athletes and what is right for kids at at every age, and it, it just I think it's so important to understand that. And we see people who come out of a certain age of, of, of coaching myself. And I, I, I tell this all the time when I, I, the 19 years of college coaching and then jumping into the youth hockey world, I had no real concept of how to be successful with 10 U, 12 U kids. And until you realize the, the needs that, uh, that those players have, uh, it's, it's really kind of uh, fruitless at times. So if you're getting into this profession, really take the time to learn what is right for each age group that you're going to coach. Yeah, for, for me, it would be probably don't sweat the small stuff. What I mean by that is when I was first coaching, like, like Pooch was talking about, when I first got into college coaching, you wanted to win so bad that everything affected you. You know, you yelled at the ref because of an offside call. You yelled at your player because he missed a pass. You know, in the grand scheme of things, I think we've all learned that we've become much better hockey coaches. When you don't focus on the outcome and all you do is focus on development. And I wish I knew that as a young coach starting a coaching career. Instead, I was focused on the outcome and I would get so wrapped up in the process that I would go haywire. Right. And now, now it's the complete opposite. If I'm in a game and my team's losing, I don't lose any sleep over it anymore. And then the, the, the funny thing is, is, the teams that we've all coached have been fairly successful because we let the kids play. We let them figure it out. We let them solve their problems and we make it about them, not about us. Yeah. Real quickly. I would just say I need to increase my patience. I was a little impatient as a young coach to understand that really your performance falls onto your training, not you as the super coach with the chalkboard or the grease board. It's, it's about the environment and the culture that you set up which really creates uh, winning and successful programs. And 
And when I was a younger coach, I thought it was about the drill. And it's really about how you treat people, the culture, and how exciting you make it for the kids walking into the rink. And my third thing is knowing this, and I think this is really important. Um, I can be a high performance coach in any rink with any kid in any state that I want to be in. Being a high performance coach doesn't mean when I thought it was a young kid of who I'm coaching, it's how can I be a high performance coach every day I walk into the rink. And if it's coaching college kids or pro guys, or if it's coaching my 11 year old daughter, how am I a high performance coach? And knowing what I know now uh, gives me a chance. I would say those three things. And just in signing off, I just wish everybody a, a safe COVID time that they're using this uh, time, um, uh, you know, wisely for themselves that everybody's kind of recharging so I know when this thing's over, we're going to hit the ground running and people are going to be dying to get back to the rinks. And, and I think that's going to be one of the most exciting times in the history of hockey when we all get back into the rink.